All right, so without further ado, uh, I'd love to bring up our next speakers, Dr. Carmen Rojas, President and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation. Dr. Carmen Rojas is a leader, dreamer, and truth teller. Prior to joining the Marguerite Casey Foundation, Dr. Carmen Rojas, oh, my screen went big there and it took my bio off. This is what Zoom tech stuff does. Okay, let me go back. Um, well, Dr. Carmen Rojas. You had to make it up. If you like <laughs> off the cuff, you had to be like, <laughs> she's really good with the flip in her hair. Where yes, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, I would love to improvise. (laughs) Black and white, she looks great in black and white. She's a queen. If I could, if I could improvise your bio, I totally would. But first I want to do justice and please let me read. And then if we have time in the end, I would love to improvise a bio on you. Okay, so let me back this up. Dr. Carmen Rojas is a leader, dreamer, and truth teller, if you can't tell already. Prior to joining the Marguerite Casey Foundation, Dr. Carmen Rojas was the co-founder and former CEO of the Workers Lab, an innovation lab that invests in entrepreneurs, community organizers, and government leaders to create replicable and revenue-generating solutions that improve conditions for low-wage workers. For more than 20 years, Carmen has worked with foundations, financial institutions, and nonprofits to improve the lives of working people across the United States. Uh, And Carmen will be in conversation with our own Meg from Power to Fly. So I'll let you two take it away. Thank you so much, Mariella. Um, Carmen, I just want to say welcome. Um, Do you prefer Dr. Rojas, actually? Carmen. All right, Carmen, it's lovely to meet you, um, and I'm super excited for today's conversation. Uh, Mariella did give you an amazing intro, um, but I would like to see if you uh, if you can share with us a little bit more about your career journey, where you're based, um, and a little bit about you as a person. Sure. Um, first and foremost, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with you and have this conversation, and thanks, Mariella, for letting me uh, interject of my in my dream situation. I feel like bios are... Um, are important and oftentimes the things that we aren't allowed to narrate um, in bio. So I'm always so curious, like for people who meet me off the cuff, like what are the things that land the most? Um, I grew up in San Jose, California. I am uh, the third, the youngest uh, of three kids. Um, My Mom is from a small town in Nicaragua, and um, my dad is from an island off the coast of Venezuela next to Trinidad, Tobago, and they immigrated in the 60s to the U.S. And um, I often tell my story as sort of um, the luck of immigrating at a different time in this country. And so my parents immigrated at the peak of the civil rights movement, of the black freedom movement, the peak of the feminist movement and the peak of the labor movement in this country. And uh, because they arrived in a country that's so different than the country we live in today, um, they uh, frankly like had a set of opportunities available to them that aren't available to many people now uh, here. Um, And so uh, I am, a product of both my parents' dreams of what's possible and uh, a sort of a burning desire to make sure that I'm not the last person in the United States to benefit from luck, to make sure that luck is the, isn't the only input that um, uh, makes it so that you can live a life of dignity in this country. Um, I Currently, I have like a really interesting, I think at least, uh, a professional trajectory. I've um, sort of been in and around the like the money space for a long time, and I am I'm, I'm kind of like a schizo- schizophrenic philanthropist. I have like a deep critique of racial capitalism. Uh, call myself a Marxist. Uh, believe that there is a future where uh, money and power aren't so deeply tied in um, tethering people to a fate and future, that there are other things that are so much more important and valuable and uh, have for the last 20 years either worked at or for or have built organizations um, where moving financial resources to leaders on the front lines of economic justice has been the key role that I've played. And now more clearly focused on racial justice and specifically on black liberation as the animating and driving force for my work and for our work at the Marguerite Casey Foundation. So it's like, um, 
it's like a funny tension that I'm always like um, leveling on. I've been playing with this idea. Uh, there's an amazing author and scholar named Kienga Yamada Taylor, and she writes a lot about um, pragmatic utopianism uh, and the ability to like understand where we are today, but a deep commitment and desire to build for a future that we know is possible and want. And so the moment I read that term, Meg, I felt like it was a calling card for me. Like I'm a pragmatist. I know that today people need money. And so I see it as my job to get uh, leaders on the front lines of the fight for racial justice as much money as possible to make sure that we uh, have a better future for us, a better country for us. Absolutely. Um, I'd never heard that phrase before today as well. So now you've got a, a new Thank rallying you. cry in me. Um, yeah, pragmatic utopia. I absolutely love that. Um, all right. So you mentioned the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what the foundation does? Sure. Um, so Marguerite Casey Foundation, I'm just gonna do like the philanthropy 101 because I think philanthropy like foundations are like these weird institutions that are often seen as benevolent. Um, and so I think context is important. We are the product of uh, an investment by Jim Casey, who was a founder of UPS. Um, most foundations exist because people get really rich and decide that instead of paying more taxes, they are going to create philanthropic institutions to uh, uh, drive and determine the agenda that they want to use their resources for, as opposed to actually giving money to our government to meet the most basic needs that people have in this country. Um, and I run one of these institutions. We are almost a billion dollar institution do about $30 million a year in grant making um, to racial justice work across the country. And the driving force for us is this belief that maybe like a two-sided belief. Oh, one is this idea that um, without philanthropy, without donors, without foundations, people would still, still find a, a way to fight. They're like, there was before foundations, people found a way to fight. And after foundations, people are gonna find a way to fight. And, uh, foundations create a more even terrain in the fight and especially in the fight for racial justice that like if done right if if we fully resource leaders so that they aren't worried about where they're going to eat or sleep or take care of their kids if these resources are truly free and made available um, it creates room for the fight to actually be a bit more fair not fair in and of itself but just a bit more fair yeah. and then, the, the second thing about Marguerite Casey Foundation that um, is a driving force is the idea that, you know, oftentimes when we talk about racial and economic justice, we talk about like growing the pie and giving people more money or like there's a, uh, it's imbued with this idea of like um, paternalism, like if only we give or if only we do. And for us, it's really about making sure that people who have long been excluded from our democracy and our economy are not only beneficiaries of it, but are at the table setting the rules of them. So that they're at the table setting the rules for how our democracy works, for who is represented and how, and they're at the table setting the rules for how our economy works, making it more just and more equitable for everybody, Meg. I very much appreciate you, you kind of highlighting the idea of maybe leveling the playing field a little bit, because I feel like things like campaign finance reform and how, how how money within the federal government gets distributed. A lot of these things are very, very opaque for most Americans. Um, and so I think you're right. It's, it's definitely something that needs to be highlighted and needs to be um, more widely understood and more transparent. Now, you talked a lot about having, um, you know, letting these, um, these change leaders, um, you know, giving them the, the platform as well as the ability, you know, to balance a personal life as well as fighting this fight without being stretched so incredibly thin like most of them are now. Um, how do you think that philanthropists can do that better job of listening to those making change to support these grassroots mo movements? Um, I know that it's something that is, is largely misunderstood, I think, by the general public. Yeah, I mean, I'll say like the first thing for me is that often like philanthropy, like most uh, resource rich and power power rich centers is overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly um, represented by people who have access not only to generational power, but institutional power and wealth. So there's like this idea that wealth is transferred, um, that there are worries that like the vast majority of Americans have that philanthropists and their families don't have. And, and I will say like the thing that I 
that um, they get wrong. I'm going to like take this question as my own Meg and answer it in this way. I feel like the thing that um, creates like a real pain point is this idea of who is proximate to the issues that we care about. So like I am a Latina. There are like two ways that I can narrate myself. I'm a Latina. I grew up working class. My parents had middle school educations. Um, and so I am an expert on working class Latino people, or I can narrate myself honestly, which is I've had access to some of the best education in the world. I have, um, and I am financially in like the top 5% of Latinos in this country, probably in the top 5% of people in this country. I have uh, access to power resources uh, and reach in ways that most Latinos don't. And I get invited into the room too often to narrate the day-to-day -day life of Latino people. And that's just a lie. Like my life is not, is not that proximate. And I think the dis we need to have greater discipline about making a difference between representation and truly redistributing power and actually creating room for people to lead. And we haven't done that well. Um, so we just find like, um, the Ivy League educated person of color who comes from generational wealth, who has a job in finance or in, in like some management consulting firm and are like, tell us about the experience of your community. And I, and I think that that um, one flattens us as communities of color. And specifically, I think for, for black and native people like really flattens the experience. I'll say as a Latina, uh, I think uh, it doesn't, uh, allow us to lift up the complexities in our communities, right? Like anti-Blackness is rampant in the Latino community and uh, we don't never name it and we don't ever talk about it because there are uh, so um, few opportunities for Afro-Latinos to be front and center in the conversations about what it means to be Latinx, Latin, Latino in this country. There's like no room for that. This, and like we flatten who we are in this country. And so for me, I have been thinking a lot about um, if it's not representation and it's not sort of um, like racial proximity, uh, how do we actually create true tethers between or true opportunities for people on the front lines of fights um, who are day to day working in their communities to make sure that uh, families, that moms, that dads, cousins, brothers, sisters, that neighbors could actually work together to set our future agenda. And I, I'll say like, I know what's wrong and I'm trying, I'm like, to be honest, like on the discovery of, of how to do this right. I think you're, I, that's, a, you've honestly hit the nail on the head as far as, you know, things that I used to think about philanthropy and how this all works. Um, and you're right. It's very much about who gets into the room and I mean, we, we have the same problem in a lot of other, a lot of other demographics where if there's nobody familiar, then you reach out to the one person who is familiar that might be a part of that demographic. And that's not always representational of the, tr the true needs of the group um, or even what most of the group is living through or living with. Um, so I think you're right. That's, that's incredibly important to recognize that. Um, now, We've talked a little bit about how the Margaret Casey Foundation works. Um, how how do you partner with these stakeholders to make benefits reach the actual persons in need? Because I think this is a lot of where people start to lose faith in something like like a philanthropic um, uh, donation or a certain program that's being created. How do you know that the people that need it are going to get it? Yeah, so we fund organizing. So they're like the. Um, we fund local community organizing in places across the country uh, where leaders uh, who run nonprofit organizations are daily engaged in the battle to reset the rules of our economy and our democracy. And so um, I think if I were to step and take an honest step back, Meg, like we're making bets, we're guessing, we're hoping. Uh, we are engaging with leaders and trusting uh, and trusting in a way that like is one way they have to trust us like we have to be transparent and I think too often the way that we have narrated like leadership or 
this thing of trust is like that uh, we we have to trust leaders. And I'm like, no, actually, like we if we decide that we're going to give an organization or a leader resources, we give them the most money that we possibly can to the IRS. We make a long term commitment. So up to five years. And in that we create a bunch of room, frankly, for people to do work like we don't see it. Um, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to transform our economy or our democracy. I just know it's possible. And I want to be able to make sure that what we're doing is being stewards of these resources in service of, of leaders, mostly because it, these are their resources. There are their resources that are not in our tax system. And so why, who am I to measure? Who am I? Like, we're, we're guessing. Uh, and, I, and I think that foundations spend an inordinate amount of time trying to find facts and fiction. Uh, and it's not, we don't know. Uh, but we have to try and we have to try a whole bunch of things. And so for me, it's um, uh, the way we gain proximity is by creating room for freedoms, room for leaders to be free, uh, free to imagine, free to try, free to dream, free to fail. You know, the way that people often talk about the tech entrepreneur, like the tech maven, the, like the tech bro, it's like, yeah, you know, like you just got kind of like a million dollars and like all of a sudden, like from this scrappy, like the way we narrate it, even in tone is absurd. Um, and went from like a scrappy thing to now it's Facebook, you know, like <laughs> that's like the, the arc of that story. We don't actually give uh, racial justice leaders on the front lines of these fights rooms to room to be clumsy or or room to be curious room to uh, try and fail and, and like share that they learn something. We don't give leaders on the front lines of the fight for economic justice, like the bandwidth and enough resources um, that actually meet the moment and the challenge that we're hoping for them to confront. And so mostly I'm like less looking at uh, accountability, uh, us, holding somebody else accountable and more them holding us accountable to making resources available for them to be able to do the work that they need to do to lead. Thank you so much for saying this. I think you're right. It's very much about trusting the people that are closer to the situation. Um, and I think you've done a very good job of kind of breaking down some of the myth or some of the um, the misinterpretation of, you know, a bunch of a bunch of rich people coming in and saying like, OK, well, this is the money we're going to give you. And it goes to that. And good luck, um, you know, really treating it less like a a gift of like, aren't you lucky to get this money? And more like, yeah, this is what you need to fight the fight that you're fighting. Because otherwise, not only are you in a David and Goliath situation right now, you're going to continue to be, and it's going to be progressively harder and progressively less even or less of a fair fight. That's um, right. Yeah, I, I thank you so much for 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 saying that. You you've the comment section is blowing up with people that agree with you. So thank you so much. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about the Freedom Scholars Program that is part of the Marjorie Casey for, uh, Foundation. And can you kind of tell us a little bit about the grant making process? Because I know that is very unclear for a lot of people that have never had to you know, write a grant or um, go after one. Yeah, um, so the Freedom Scholars, I'm going to do like grant making and then Freedom Scholars. I mean, let's start with Freedom Scholars just because it's like a neater box. Um, I believe ideas are important. Uh, and on the right wing of this country, conservatives are spending a lot of time uh, investing in ideas, creating values, and then influencing culture. And I think we lack that type of investment for more progressive people, for people who are explicitly, explicitly doing and saying things like defund the police, uh, explicitly in doing things that actually allow us to reimagine what it means to give land back explicitly doing and reimagining things like everybody having a house to sleep in every night, right? Um, those people with those ideas in academic institutions are often under-resourced and isolated. And uh, I just, you know, I think ideas are so, so important tied to values and culture. And so one of the first things that I did when I started in this job was launch the Freedom Scholars Program. And I'll be transparent, the first round of Freedom Scholars were people who had like um, left an indelible mark on how I saw the world. People like Kianga Yamada Taylor, who I just mentioned, Ananya Roy here at UCLA, who's doing a lot of work on uh, 
uh, like housing and homelessness. Um, and so we wanted to give them resources. And so we just did like a $250,000 award to each of the Freedom Scholars that they can use the money however they wanted to. Like we weren't going to tell them they were going to have to do a research project for us, that they had to produce something for us. It was like really freedom money. If we believe in freedom dreams and right now and being a, the pragmatist, I, I am in charge of resources. How do we create, re, how do we give resources for people to realize freedom dreams? And that's really the genesis of the Freedom Scholars Program. This is that we're about to announce our next round of Freedom Scholars and they chose amongst themselves. So it's really like something that we support in partnership with the Group Health Foundation uh, in service of creating sort of this broader network and echo chamber and amplifying effect of some of the most brilliant scholars, I think, in this moment. Um, how we do grant making, Meg, we are like in the beginning of figuring out how to do this. So I'll tell you what um, we are imagining, like a pared down process, like, like uh, people submitting applications that they submitted to other places, um, nothing that's unique to us, not spending, a, people spend, people who run nonprofit organizations, as somebody who comes directly from that, I just spent an inordinate amount of time writing and reading for a funder, glad handling, like, hey, here I am, my idea is the best. Um, a lot of time in like the uh, lack of transparency. So like, yeah. how, how come I got, how come May got $20 and I got $5, but we both run the same size organizations or have the same size budget. And so frankly, the thing that we've been doing since I've started is actually trying to remove all of those barriers, right? So like getting rid of the reporting process. We fund organizations up to, who have budgets up to $5 million and no larger. We fund local community organizing, but the amount is actually contingent on your budget by IRS rules. We're not like internally doing like the, I got a good program officer lottery and that's why I got more money. We don't, yeah. we are not, uh, we're not the experts in your work. You are the experts in your work and we have a duty to be transparent in our work with you. Um, so we're really trying to figure out how to make it as easy as possible for leaders to have the resources they need. Um, and we're different in that way, I think right now, Meg. It definitely sounds like it. Um, and I love, I love highlighting the fact that, you know, you're giving these people, um, you're giving these people money, but without a lot of the strings and a lot of the bureaucracy and the paper trails and things that that can very much snarl the process so so quickly, especially for if you're dealing with very like smaller local orgs. You know, these are people that don't have extra interns they can throw at filling out these applications for them. These are people that don't have the time to jump through those hoops um, because they're too busy keeping everything running. Okay. Um, so I, I think that's so, so great. Um, we don't have a ton of time left, but I do want to get one last question in and then we'll talk sure. a little bit about how we can connect with you and support you. Um, yeah. One of the things that we have obviously learned tons about since the, the onset of the COVID-19 health crisis um, is the, um, the intensified and, you know, might uh, very much like, uh, you know, uh, expanded struggles of workers as well as increased racial inequity in the U.S. Um, I'd really like to hear what your perspective is on it and how the Marguerite Casey Foundation is working to kind of mitigate that pandemic impact on um, people of color as well as um, you know people from the working class and low. Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of things, right? Like the pandemic just made visible something that has always been true in American history. That's just like, um, uh, and I will talk specifically about our work on uh, an initiative called Answer the Uprising, which is meant to hold police accountable and imagine a world without policing and the carceral state. And for me, the most striking thing of June 2020 and of 2020 generally was one, the pandemic, but two, like the sheer amount of people who were like, I didn't know racial disparities were so great. I thought this was more, more than we were like living in like a, a panacea. Uh, where everybody had equal access to opportunity. And it was just like, they kind of chose to take opportunity. They chose not to take opportunity. It was like left to the individual. Um, it seemed really crazy to me that the vast majority of white Americans specifically had not tied, had not understood a simple fact 
we have lived more, more years as a country uh, governed by slavery as the driving economic institution than with a true commitment to integration and opportunity. Like those are two things, like more years, just like sheer more time. And somehow people imagine that we could replace 500 years with a decade, if that, right? Like we had a civil rights act and like quickly thereafter started to see the atrophying and the hollowing out of those gains. And now we are living in this moment where people are now like grappling with something that I think many people and specifically black people have known to be true in this country that like racial disparities um, are, are a product of the system that we have and we need to work tirelessly to create a different system. We launched Answer the Uprising because I was struck that in the middle of a pandemic, millions of people took to the street because the police were killing black people. The police were targeting black people because black people were paying taxes uh, that were actually um, uh, part, parts of police budgets and that they had no yeah. right to safety, that their life had no sanctity, that people took to the street for that and that the response um, was like hit or miss, you know, like we, people talk about defund, but in no police, in no city across the country, have we seen a decrease in police funding and an increase in housing an increase in healthcare. We know what a world without policing looks like, right? It's, it's the white suburb. Uh, it's like, oh my, yeah, hundred percent. It's my neighborhood in Seattle, right? Like the, the police aren't there unless somebody calls them, but they're yeah. not the constant Bigger. And so when I think about the pandemic and COVID and frankly, 2020 as a year, I take it as um, an opportunity. This like um, going back to like pragmatic utopianism is like a it's a portal to what's possible because every nobody could turn away from the, the truth. Right. Like nobody can turn away from the truth that we have been living in sort of this bifurcated country. And I'm I am so deeply hopeful mostly because of the leaders on the front lines of the fight for racial justice, that we are seeding the ground for something different. You and me both. Um, I think there was a lot of, you know, you talk about the country being bifurcated and in my view, it's honestly a ton of bubble situations. And so I feel like within the last 18 to 24 months, we've had a lot of people who've had their bubbles popped and it is much more of a, of a wake up call for some people than for others. And for many, it's like, yes, yeah, so this is every day glad that you joined the party. We need to keep moving. Um, so I, I absolutely love what you're doing. I'm so, so excited to, to be able to support you. Um, can you share with us how, how people can connect with you and support you and the Margaret Casey Foundation in these endeavors? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, at Casey Grant. So on the social media, we have an amazing uh, creative and storytelling team and are always working to lift up the work of our grant recipients. Please follow us there. Um, and ask questions like we have an open door institution. We see it as our job to be transparent and accountable to our brothers and sisters on, on the front lines of these fights and um, know that we have an open door policy. It may take us a little bit of time because we're a small and scrappy team and uh, our commitment is to be responsive. So mostly posing that question back to folks listening. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm so, so happy to have spent the last half hour um, in, you know, in conversation with you and learning more about, um, about your role in this foundation and what y'all are doing. Um, thank you so much oh, for spending time you. with us and, for, and sharing with our community. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for having me. Like, I, like, it's such like a, a respite, like a, uh, an, uh, it, I have always the opportunity to actually talk and engage and start to imagine and like to be honest about the things that I do know and don't know and that we're still trying to understand as an institution. It's so, Absolutely. it's so helpful. So thank I, you. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, Mariella, I know we're over on time, but thank you. I'm going to turn the floor back over to you. I uh, can't wait to see the next, uh, the next session. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, Carmen. So I had, I said, if we had time, I would re read the improvised bio that I was writing. I don't think we have enough oh, time. Yeah. So I will, I will email it to you. Maybe yeah. we can post it on Power to Fly too, so people can see and, uh, or we can put it in the comment section, but thank you so much, Carmen. Uh, I'm going to be reaching out. <laughs> thank you, Mariela. Bye. Awesome. Ciao.